Welcome back to the Main Basketball Rankings Podcast. I am your host, basketball data nerd, Lucas McNally. We're going to do a little more running today. Um, had Connor Daigle on to talk about uh, running at UMaine the other day. And today is one of the best runners in the state of Maine, the 2013 Maine Marathon champion, the two-time winner of the Waldebro Half Marathon. And you know him from the Beach to Beacon 10K. Robert Gomez is here. Thank you for having Thank me. You for, thanks for doing this. So let's start with Beach to Beacon because that's probably what everyone remembers you from. Um, famously in, uh, I want to say it was 2015. I wrote this 20, down and lost my notes. 2017. 2017. 2017, you uh, carried a fallen runner across the finish line rather than flying right by him to win the race. Um, which is a race you had been trying to win for a couple years. And that, of course, went viral. And I was looking it up the other day, and it was everywhere, that story. Yeah, it, it uh, made the rounds. I actually, my, my favorite tidbit from that is I had Facebook messages from people in Russia who had read the story and had found me on Facebook and had sent messages and be like, that's a really cool story. Their, their English was a little broken, but they were able to sure. relay the fact that uh, they thought it was a very cool story, and uh, they wanted to congratulate me on on being a good person, I guess. And that's <laughs> that was kind of fun. I did. It was cool to hear from people from all over about that. It was uh, it was a neat experience. I was just right place, right time, and um, uh, the the great benefit of uh, that is that I gained a friend in in the guy I picked up, Jesse Orrick, uh, and uh, sure. Now I get to talk about it on podcast six, seven years later. <laughs> it, it never dies. I remember I was in that race and I was probably at like mile two when this happened um, <laughs> because I'm much slower than you. And But you started hearing something had happened at the finish line, something weird had happened at the finish line. And I don't run with my phone and I left my phone in my car. And so you get to the finish line and I think I saw Jeff Sprague and he's like, yeah, I think Gomez did something. He's like, I'm not really sure what happened. And it was all very weird. And then, like the next day, you're on like run the cover of Runner Runners World's website, and I'm like, whoa. <laughs> I actually um, I did a little interview for uh, the Today Show. That was fun. Wow. Um, yeah. Uh, I I remember my uh, they talked about the whole story a little bit on the Today Show, and I remember John Cena um, was a guest host for the show that day, and and he said, hey. You know that that's really cool. Though. You know, I, I can't do a John Cena voice, but he was like, "Yeah, right. that's very cool." You know, I, I, I think that's really cool. What that guy did. It's real. You know, it takes a lot of heart. And so now I joke with people that John Cena and I are best friends. So that's, besties. Uh, that's that's worked besties. out for me. Now, did I read somewhere correctly that technically you could have been disqualified, or Jesse could have been disqualified for getting technically, assistance? Technically, both of us should have been disqualified. Um, okay. And yeah, by the letter of the law. Um, helping a runner across the finish line disqualifies both the runner that who who's providing the help and the runner who got the help. Um, I think um, Joe Minoy Samuelson, who I serve on the Beach to Beacon board now with, and she, it's her race. She created it. Obviously, you know her as being the nineteen eighty four. I think yeah. eighty four um, Olympic champion in the marathon in L.A. Um, among many other things, but. She uh, she plays a very big part of the role. She happened to be at the finish line. Um, obviously, the race officials were discussing the issue, and in her her knowing that this would probably be good for the race, um, and it would it, she spoke to the race officials and said, "No, you can't disqualify these folks. It's it's going to be this is going to be big news. Let's not DQ them. We're not. We don't want to look like the the." And who's going to argue? So, and I don't think anyone argues with Joni when it comes to running. No. So, um, so yeah, that's that's how that played out. And, and but technically speaking, yes, you know, we both should have been disqualified. But really, it's up to the up to the race officials to make that call. Right. And was this a thing? And that's I mean, that's the right call. That's you know, it's like fouling the best player out with four minutes left in the game on a ticky tack foul. You don't do it. You know, <laughs> you just don't do it. It's stupid. I like to tie back into the basketball podcast. That's See, it's I've done a couple of these. Um, <laughs> so, like when you're coming into that stretch, because I mean, I've run that, and you're, 
the scene at the finish line there is a little bit madness and there's all those people and you've been busting, you know, for a, for a 10 K and you've got nothing left in the tank. It would have been really easy to just keep going. And like, I, you know, I don't even know if I would have seen him. Uh, I mean, I knew, um, and, and when you're, I'm, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but when you're at that, at that position in a race, you mm-hmm. know, when even when there's seven thousand people in the race, when you're when you're up front, there's a little room in between runners, and you can kind of know, see, and know who's in front of you. Um, right. I knew that Jesse was in front of me. I was trying to chase that overall main title, um, and I knew Jesse was ahead of me, and, and he had a leg up on that. Um, so when I turned a corner, um, and as you've run Beach to Beacon, you kind of it's the the finish is not straight on to the lighthouse. There's a little bit of a right. turn when you go before you get to the finish shoot and it was on that turn as I came around the turn where Jesse was kind of had hit the ground and he was trying to get up and there were some medical officials around him. And I had three or four seconds to decide what to do. And and maybe it was my oxygen depleted state that I decided it was a great (laughs) idea to pick him up. Probably from, I think medical professionals will probably tell you when someone's lying on a ground on the ground, don't go and pick them up right away because it might be really wrong. But yeah. I picked him up, you know, and I was like, come on, we'll finish this thing. And I, you know, I, I didn't really have a lot of time to think about it. I just did it. And uh, and when coming to the finish line, I don't know why, but I just felt like since he led the race from start from the start to that point when mm-hmm. I found him, I felt like it would have been disingenuous to come all that way and then and then have then me beat him. So that's why when we got to the line, I kind of gave him a nudge across the line because the bib number that you wear yeah. has a chip in it, of course. And that gets triggered by the first mat, the front of the first mat in the finish line. So I knew that. So crossing, I made sure when we got to that first mat, he, I pushed him so he would go across first. And if you look at the video, it looks like I kind of gave him a shove. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I think, you don't have a lot left there at that point. I know. I don't, I didn't really have a lot of like energy to like monitor, like, manage the fall it was just like get over there um but that's how it played out and i mean i i just i i've had some people joke that it was a preconceived thing that i that i thought about this to to do it i had literally four or five <laughs> seconds to decide what to do i just yeah. saw him on the ground picked him up and walked him across it wasn't there there was there was no time to think about the ramifications of what i was doing i just did it my my luck would have been i would have picked him up and then i would have fallen because I just, <laughs> just had nothing left in the tank. And then we both would have fallen. And then the guy in third would have beaten both of us. That's what would have happened to me. Uh, you know, it, it, it's the effort. It's the idea that counts, right? Yeah, you would have uh, gone viral for a very different reason then. <laughs> uh, yep. All right. So you also do coaching. It's uh, Eastern Shore Training, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, look at that. I got it right. Don't even have my notes or anything. Um, <laughs> so... Let's talk about Beach to Beacon. So we're about a month, a little over a month out from the race. Yep. And let's say you you, you registered back in March, I think, February, something yep. like whatever the thing is. And you had gr- all the intention in the world. Mm-hmm. And I think like a lot of people, you've maybe not done all the workouts on your plan. So and you realize it's a month out, you know, and you go, OK, well, how do I sort of like maximize this final month what would you tell a runner in that situation like what are the things they should be doing a month out of beach to beacon to get their best time are you you asking for a friend (laughs) yes (laughs) there was this This heat wave this this is what this is Is you're like oh come on the podcast we'll do everything yeah you're just getting free advice i see what's going on pretty much yeah there was this heat (laughs) wave it was terrible i actually am not actually registered this year i'm registered for the i'm doing the lobster festival 10k because yeah. I was been was injured and I was just like, I don't even know if my body's going to hold up to 10K training and I didn't want to register and then not run it. So I'm just going to do um, Lost Trust, which is the next day. But mm-hmm. like, let's say you're, so you're a month out. What, what would you tell someone? Um, uh, Let's say, for example, that someone's registered, they had all the intention in the world to train and they're a month out and they haven't done any training. Let's, let's okay. use that. I've they done some training. training. You've, You've seen done some training. You've seen my Strava. Yes. See, what I would say is 
if you've done very little or no training, I would say don't don't go out and start hammering runs right now because it's you're going to tire yourself out. You're not, and by the time you, a month from now, when you get to the starting line, you're probably going to feel fatigued, and you're going to go, "This sucks." You know, I don't, I, I don't want to do this, or you run a bad race. You're like, I don't want to do Vishu Beacon ever again. I would say be gentle with yourself. You know, start getting – start do small runs, be consistent, make sure they're easy, and then slowly build that up so that when you get to the 10K, right, you it's not a daunting task to finish it. Um, but if you're, right. if you're looking to run a, a fast time and you haven't run, you know, really a lot and, and you're a month out from the race – my my i want to say this as gently as possible probably <laughs> you're probably not going to run your best time at the beach to be oh. just go out do what you can to finish and, and have a good time with it and then maybe use that as a jump jump off point for your next race okay so let's use the better version of that where you have been doing the training mm-hmm. and you're hitting your things but you're still yep. a month out you know it's not you're not three days out where all the hay is in the barn as yep. they like to say, yep. what are things that are beach to beacon specific that you would want to focus on in your training that would match that? Cause the course, you know, every course is different. Right. Um, beach to beacon specifically is, uh, it could be, as you know, it could be, uh, hot. It could be humid. Yeah. Um, it, it rolls, the course rolls quite a bit in terms of hills. So if for someone who never trains on hills, um, might be a good time to get get some hills in over the next couple of weeks, few weeks to get used to that. Uh, the best thing that someone can do if they've gotten some training in but not a lot is to take maybe one day a week for the next few weeks um, and do a 10K specific workout, which is what I, one of my favorite things is to do um, kilometers, right? For, for those who, who – um, only stick to the standard system. That's a little over half a mile. Right. And, and for some people that might be, you know, three and a half, four minutes. Some people that might be five minutes. My recommendation, if you want to do it on a road is to do um, four or five minutes at your goal 10 K pace, and then take a minute rest, what I call a jog rest. Um, it could be a walking rest, um, depending on your, on your level of ability, but right. that, but you do repeats of that. So do a little warm up, do five minutes, four to five minutes at your goal 10 K pace, do a minute jog or walk rest, and then do that again. And I would say for the first workout, do that about, mm, I would say, you know, maybe five or six times the second time out, do a, do another, an additional repeat for that second workout, the second week, do like, you know, six to seven, and then maybe do seven to eight or nine for that final workout and space them out a week in advance. And my recommendation is try to find a, a, a place to do that, that rolls just like beach to beacon and do it at the time of day that if you can, so not everyone can, but do try to do it at the time of day that beach to beacon happens like in the morning, um, get your body used to running hard in the morning, in the heat, in the humidity, uh, and, and simulate that racing experience. Cause really we race the way that we train. And if we train, if our training simulates the race as much as possible, we're going to be more prepared for the race than we would otherwise. Okay. So now let's say it's race day. <laughs> I love this game. Yeah. So let's say it's race day. And because, you know, if I were asking you about the Waldboro half marathon, it would be completely different advice. And so that's, yeah. I think, which is. It would, it would just be would interesting. Be, it's interesting. I would say my advice is get into a corner and cry. And then <laughs> yeah, perfect. Then you're all set. <laughs> um, so let's say it's race day and you're not, you know, in the uh, the elite section where they like drive you to the start line and all that stuff. But yeah. what's stuff that you want to do in on race day, the day before, like right in the thing to, you know, maximize your opportunity to hit your goal time or whatever you're trying to accomplish, even if it's just finishing? Mm-hmm. Um, prepare, give yourself plenty of time before the race, uh, to make sure you have bathroom breaks, uh, cause those bathroom sure lines you, are long There's bathroom lines. There's parking lines. There's line. I mean, there's 7,000 people at the beach to begin the 7,500, um, some, some years. So you've got to understand that that's going to jam you up 
no matter what you do, because everyone else is trying to do the same thing. Um, right. So when it comes to bathrooms, parking, um, getting to the start, uh, warming up, uh, because it's, it's hard to warm up when you're in a corral with 7,000 other runners. So you may want to find a place to, to jog around a little bit for a few minutes, get, get the legs warmed up, because you don't want to launch right into that race pace right at the start. Um, keep in mind, that first mile is downhill. Um, for the most part, it levels out at the end. But that first mile, especially with thousands of other people around you, you could get carried away and, and, and go way faster than – um, you want to, or you could get jammed up. That. If you're in the wrong spot, you could get jammed up and go a lot slower. So the best thing I could say for someone who's kind of in the pack for Beast to Beacon is that first mile might not end up being what you think it's going to be in terms of pace. So don't worry about it too much if your pace is a little slower, or a little faster than what you're aiming for, because it, it, a lot of different things can happen. You you know in terms of being in that crowd. Then once you get through that first mile, things start to space out. Things start to level off in terms of in terms of the course uh, terrain, and then you can really lock into your pace. And that's that that's where I think a lot of people go wrong is that first mile. You know, you could be a lot slower, a lot faster than you're used to, and, and they panic. Understand right. going in that it's going to be a little weird. So um, if you're if it it is weird, and you're like, okay, I knew this was going to happen. I'm fine. I'm just going to take a deep breath, and I'm going to. Or whatever you do for breathing when your heart rate's at 150, 160 beats a minute, and just you know chug along. And and as long as you have that in mind, I think you'll be okay. And I was gonna say that if try to know, uh, figure out who ahead of you is not in the right place in the corrals, <laughs> because there's <laughs> there's always that 12 minute mile runner who lines up at like with the seven minute mile people. And then there's yeah. like a log jam behind them. Yeah. And you're just like, what are you doing? <laughs> Why yeah. would you do oh, this? I, I love, I love the guy who shows up with like cargo shorts and filas and lines up on the start line, right, right next to on the front with everyone else. That there's one guy like that every race or at least every small local race. And it's like, Hey man, good for you. But at least when the gun goes off, just if there's someone behind you, that's maybe a little more prepared, just let them go by. You know. See, I, the corollary of that is if you see a guy who's like got jean shorts on that dude, do not mess with that dude. Cause that dude is going to can kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> do you know that there's a company in France that's actually trying to create the jean running shorts? Are they really? No. Oh, yeah. I don't, don't have me quote the name, but I, I didn't see it the other day. They're trying to make it a thing. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> and then what's what's the approach for the finish? Like, is there because the finish is a little tricky. You've got that like hairpin turn. Yeah. And I believe there's a hill right there. Yeah. It's been a while since I've run it. Yeah. And then you so, get the big crowd. Yeah, if you get the crowd at the end. I mean, it, I call it going into the cage because of course it's it's a big fence that goes around Fort Williams and, and you enter through mm -hmm. through a gate, what I call the cage, and then and there's an immediate sharp up. That's kind of like on a turn. So it really slows you down quite a bit. If you have any momentum going down the hill into the park, you immediately hit the brakes because you're, you, you've hit this hill that goes on a sharp turn. Then you take another turn. Then it goes on around a wider turn. And then, then you have a straightaway. So I, I would say for people that um, are approaching the finish, you know, that last mile is pretty rolling. It can slow you down. But when you get into the cage, up that sharp hill, and you make that turn um, – uh, finally to the top of the hill and into the park that's where you can kind of like start working towards the finish and speeding things up because you at that point you have a little over a quarter mile of the finish right and then you know once you get to the finish you just want to make sure that you don't look like an idiot in the picture right and if you know if you're smart you won't stop to pick anyone up either <laughs> yeah yeah because if you're in the pack then there's other people who can pick that guy up yeah you know fine. It's someone else there's problem. There's medics. There's a whole thing. <laughs> Do you, when, when you're doing a race and you're trying to, cause you're trying to win the race, you know, but like if you're running a race, like uh, let's say Boston, where you're probably not going to win it, although you did finish 32nd one year. Yeah. Um, do you, if you're trying to do hit a goal time, like how do you keep track of that during the race? Boston's really tough because there's, as you know, there's, 25,000 people in Boston, no matter 
who you are, unless you're the elite of the elite, you're going to be following someone. You're going to be in a pack. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the, and it's a very, very downhill first mile. And it's overall a downhill first 10 miles. So the, the hard, one of the hardest things to do in Boston is pace yourself correctly. I've done Boston mm, seven times now. I've paced myself correctly once and that was in, that was last year so i oh wow i was really thrilled about that but basically what that meant is to know what your marathon pace is and of course you train your marathon pace and training so you you mm-hmm. know what you're capable of and then stick to it and it's really hard to do that in boston because everyone else is going out faster than their marathon pace because they're making the same mistakes so right it, here i am in a pack for the first 10 miles and I had people, you know, I'm, I'm in a group of my peers because they line you up with roughly the people that you can, that, who run the same pace for, for an overall marathon. And I had people passing me for the first 10 miles. I'm locked into my pace, knowing mm-hmm. exactly what I need to do, and I am losing ground on everyone else. Are you doing it's that what, by feel or are you doing I, the, are you using the watch? I'm using the watch. I'm using okay. the watch. I know, I know exactly what I need to run in those first 10 miles to, to keep pace with what I want to do. Um, and so I was, you know, I, I was within my, the pace I wanted to hit within two or three seconds, every mile for the first 10 miles. Um, and then beyond that, and then what do you think happened with all those people who were passing me the first 10 miles? They all came back after the first, most of them, not all, but most of them. And so I, I ended up last year. I mean, it wasn't my fastest Boston and my best Boston, but it was just for my ability level at the time, it was my best pace Boston. And I ended up getting a hundredth. Um, but it was, That's pretty good. It was, but it was, it was my, you know, it was my, I ran very good splits. I ran like a one thirteen and then a one fourteen thirty. which as you know, since the first half is downhill and then you have heartbreak Hill and on the Newton Hills in the second half, it's a pretty good split. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm tooting my own horn a little bit, but I believe it or not, yes, I've run a lot faster in Boston. I've run a 222 and change, but the the Boston I'm most proud of is last year where I where I I really ran it intelligently. I can't even fathom running that fast. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of like one of the things I've been most proud of in a race was I was uh, what was it the Cape Elizabeth 10 miler. I ran it one year and I wasn't in great shape, but I was in okay shape. But I like my splits were dead even. For mm-hmm. like, not in first nine miles, and I was like, just afterwards, like, all right, okay, that's pretty good, you know. It didn't fall yeah. apart or anything. And then the la- the ninth mile, I I kicked it up a little bit and was able to go a little faster. One thing I've done in the past is I'll take a sharpie and I'll write splits on it. Mm. You know, I'll sort of look at like maybe for a five k if I know the course well, I'll be like, okay, I want to do this mile. The first mile I want to be in at seven fifteen, and then this mile I want to do that mile in this, and then because I'll just you know you get out there and you forget, you're like, what right. was it exactly? What was I supposed to be doing? Was this the mile where I was supposed to go fast, or was this the mile where I was supposed to go slow? Right. And I mean, is that a crazy idea? No, okay. um, I actually I've written my paces right you know down here on a. I know I yeah, got, just straight down yeah, the forearm. Not, not the permanent tattoos, but there goes. Yeah, so right <laughs> here, I've written, I've, I've, I've written my splits right here on, on uh, with permanent marker and washed off later. Um, but there actually are services. Believe it, there's something. There's a company for everything. There's a company where you could buy temporary tattoos that have your paces on, on a sheet, and you can put the temporary tattoo right. Oh, on your, that makes sense. In your inner arm. It's pretty smart i mean i've seen people do it i've seen people have like excel spreadsheets in their arms like like they're a quarterback and i'm like what is that it's like all oh, my paces for the entire marathon i'm like i want to give you shit for that but that's actually pretty cool <laughs> i mean because yeah you get to mile 15 you're like i don't know what was I supposed to do uh, here what do, yeah and then you look what are we even go, doing? Oh, yeah, that's where i need to be <laughs> the other thing i'll do is in my head i'll be doing the math i'll be like so say i want to run like eights you know, for the race and you're, this is your warm up pace. But anyway, right. um, for me, the eights, you know, and then the first mile I come in at seven fifty eight. I'm like, okay, so now I got two seconds in the bank. I got 10 seconds in the bank. I, I you know, I owe five seconds, whatever it is as sort of a running yeah. tally along yeah. the way. And I, I find that helps me a little bit. Um, all right, let's pivot. Cause you, yeah, let's pivot to coaching. So one thing you know, it used to be you would, if you wanted to play, if you just wanted to run, you could run. But if you wanted to plan for something, 
you had you, you get those couch to 5k things or you could find a plan online mm-hmm. and now they even have like garmin will have these adaptive plans in mm-hmm. your connect thing where it'll give you a plan but why should did they not do that and hire a coach? Um, coaches provide uh, a level of accountability and a level of customization that even the best uh, Garmin tools and AI tools really can't do to this point. Uh, right. they're, they're, I mean, are they getting better? Absolutely. Uh, but there's something about uh, and then this is not coming from me. This is coming from uh, the clients that I work with. And, and I've, I've worked with, you know, right now I have around 30 clients that I'm currently training and I, I've trained roughly 250 different people since 2014. Um, so I would say their biggest takeaway is they enjoy having that person that they could talk to and having a real person keep them accountable. Um I mean, a plan, anyone can put together a training plan um, from scratch, but really what it, what it takes is someone to um, kind of put the pieces together that customizes it around, you know, their injury history, their, what they've run, done for running so far, what they've, um, you know, what their life is like, uh, many, any vacations. So it's kind of, it, it, it takes a lot of different variables that it's hard for a cookie cutter plan to consider and then put it all on paper and then have someone be, keep them accountable to that. That's the benefit of a, of a running coach. And I, and you know, I, I, some people, uh, I, I, I do have some people that have used like the Hal Higdon plans or the Garmin plans or, or um, other things. And they come to a coach and be like, that was fine. That got me to where I wanted to go for a little bit, but now I want to take the next step. That's why I'm reaching out to a running coach. And it, and to this point, you know, they, they've liked the, they, they've benefited from having a, a real coach instead of a, a cookie cutter plan. Now, do they need to be able to like meet with you in person or like, do you need to see them run? Can it be entirely virtual? It can be entirely virtual, and the majority of my clients are. Um, is there a benefit in meeting people in person? Absolutely. I just that's not something that's not a service that I myself have the ability to provide because I don't, you know, I have clients from all over and I can't see all of them. And you know, right. there could be video chats and whatnot, but um, there are coaches that do provide that. So. Um, you know, obviously, if you want a coach that's going to meet you in person or talk to you in person on a reg- on a regular basis, you know, like every day or whatnot, that's a service that you're going to end up having to pay for that. Um, right. But the, the the service that I provide is a, a you know a little less intense. Uh, it's more like a you know some phone some phone conversations, some emails, you know, a consultation, um, and then uh, a training plan on a on a uh, platform that uses an app and it works out pretty well for most people. And some people, they want more than that. And, and, and they pursue coaches who provide that, but you know, and, uh, I usually have a pretty good, uh, like rotating group of folks that I, that I work with, um, month in and month out, uh, that, that benefit from the way that I provide coaching. What does the onboarding of that look like? Do you have them like run a two mile speed test at first to sort of get a sense of their, like where they are. So you can sort of build out paces or do you sort of look at their Strava history and sort of ballpark it and then adjust on the fly? Like what's, what does that look like? Yeah. So usually the people that come to me, they've already, you know, competed in, in races or, or done workouts prior to that. If it's someone that has never run uh, a race before, uh, then maybe I would work with them to work out a time trial, but that, that usually doesn't happen. Usually people come to me because they want to get better than what they've done in a race before. And so okay. we base, we base their ability to, to get where they want to go and, or baseline their fitness off of what they've done recently in terms of races and, and uh, runs and workouts. So you've already got a time trial. You can say, Hey, I just saw you just ran a 5k in this and you can talk, how did that go? You know, yeah. did you fall apart or like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can get all the information off that. Exactly. And then as they're running along in the thing, if they go, hey, this may be the mileage is a little too high for me, or mm-hmm. I'm getting this niggling little pain or whatever, then you right. can adjust as they go. Yep. 
That's exactly. fantastic. All you right, know, I you, you 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 could be a coach. Be a coach. I, yeah, that would be great. Like, who's how good's your coach? Uh, he's not good. He's I, real, I think, well, I real mean, slow. And and, and that's <laughs> something I want to point out. I mean, I, I yeah, I've. I've had some success with running that doesn't necessarily make me a good coach. I think a good coach has to have a good understanding, obviously the running principles, but also needs to be able to be um, like to listen to their athletes, be flexible, provide good feedback, um, be a good motivator, um, provide accountability. You don't, uh, I, I don't think the better of an, and a coach is as an athlete does, that does not necessarily track with how good they are as a coach. So that that's, you know, maybe I'm undercutting my underselling myself, or maybe I'm cutting out clients because I'm saying it doesn't matter how good I am, but it really doesn't. It doesn't matter how good the coach is as a runner. It matters how good they are as, as a, um, a coach. And that well, those, very, two don't, those two don't always track, you know, very often the best basketball coaches are like backup point guards. Yeah, Joe Mazzullo. I mean, what did he do in the NBA? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. There you, go. you know, it's a lot of managers in baseball are catchers, you yeah. know, that sort of thing. And it's just, it's who sees the, the whole field or the whole court or, you know, understands the legal system. So let's say people do want to, let's, let's get you some clients here if we can. Um, if people want to hire you as a coach, how would they reach you? What would they, what would they do? Uh, I have a website. Uh, it's called Eastern Shore Training dot com all one word uh i i work through a coaching conglomerate it's called team run run uh it's a it's a collection of online coaches from all over the country uh and and the the management the account management and and kind of the the billing and so forth and and setup all goes through team run run um i joined them uh last year they're a great outfit and what that does is it provides uh the potential athletes, a whole bunch of options because they can go in and go, yeah, I'm, you know, I want to train with Rob or I could take a look at these other coaches. And there's, there's a hundred other coaches that they online running coaches that they could choose from, from all over the country. It doesn't have to be just me. So um, the folks could go to my website, like I said, Eastern shore training.com and that will bring them, they will be able to, if they want to sign up, that will bring them to the team run run site. And then if they want to work with me, they can, but if they want to check, check out, what else is out there? They're more than welcome to. All right. Uh, one last thing. Can you get Joni or someone at beach to beacon, put some water at the bottom of the hill after the finish line, <laughs> because you just run a 10 K it's like 80 degrees. It's humid. Yep. And you gotta walk up a hill to get water. It's, it's insane. They yeah. gotta put some water at the bottom of the hill. I know. So the, the layout of the finish area, is going to change this year, and, I, and I, oh. I don't have I don't have the the uh, blueprint in front the of thing. me, but it the thing, yeah, but it doesn't. Um, it, it's going to change a little bit. I can't guarantee there's going to be water at the bottom of the hill, but it is going to change a little bit um, to make it just more, a suggestion more pat more friendly for the runners after the race in terms of like you know oh, yeah. out, go, going to the beer tent or whatever. It, it's it's going to be. Um, I, I think the layout's going to be better, uh, and uh, I will make that recommendation to the board <laughs> that we have water sooner to the finishers. Cause I, I, because right. I had to go to right. the med tent one year because I was just like about to faint, and I like water would have been fine. I would have been fine with just water, but they sort of looked at me and went, yeah, let's get you over here in the med tent. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, it's not looking you great. Up, you didn't end up in the tub, did you? No, there's a tub. Was it like an ice tub? Uh, yeah, you don't want to know what happens if you go in the tub. No, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, are you going to be at the Waldebro Half Marathon? It is gonna, what date this year? You going to torture yourself again? I don't remember. September 20 uh, something. Okay. Keep in mind, September that 20... the race director does not know the date of his own race. That's okay. We'll I it slide. It's don't a ways remember. Out. It's a ways out. It's right before the main. Mar it's a good training race. For your goal race in October, that's it's like two weeks out from when the goal races start kicking in. And unfortunately, my goal race this year is the Berlin Marathon. Oh, it cool! It happens September 29th. So, oh, I mean, might be the week before then. Yeah, so I mean, all those hills the week before might be stretching it a bit, but yeah, who knows? I might make it. A and that's a very flat 
Yeah, uh, marathon. Those two are very, those two are very, very different in terms of terrain. September twenty first. I just looked it up. And have Ooh. you ever been to Berlin? I have not. Oh, you're gonna love Berlin. Awesome. Can't so wait. I went there years ago. This is I'm taking you way over, but you can tell where you are in the city if you're in East or West Berlin based on the traffic lights, because oh, really? the traffic lights, yeah, the traffic lights have a different design. And it's like a whole big thing there and they sell t-shirts and about it, whatever. And they have uh, painted, they have the Berlin wall painted on the road, oh, like where, it, where, where it used there. to be. Yeah. yeah and so like, cool. it's a lot of small stuff like that. Like I think the manhole covers are different in East and West Berlin and a lot of cool stuff like that, but you're going to love it. It's a very cool city. Yeah. My, so the kind of the reason that it's, it's exciting for me to go, not, not just because it's Berlin, um, so my dad spent uh, close to 10 years there working as a oh, civilian wow. for the British Army in West Berlin back in the 70s and 80s. Um, wow. So he's, he, sees, he has seen a very, very different Berlin, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and he, because I'm going over, that's incentivized him to come back over with my mom. So they're going to meet me over there. They're going to see Berlin. He can he can give us the grand tour. I'm sure it's very different from when he left back in '81, yeah. but um, he'll give us the tour. I went over there for a screening, and I because so one of my family members was in the battalion that found Hitler, and um, oh, wow. yeah, so I went to a, I had a screening there, and I got up there, and I said uh, I would just like to apologize. The last time a member of my family was in Germany, they stole a bunch of Hitler silverware, and I did not bring it back. <laughs> That's pretty good. I don't think you can right. apologize for that. No, I don't think so. Um, all right. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this podcast has been a production of MainBasketballRankings.com. If you enjoyed this, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. You can find this wherever you uh, podcast. And go follow Robert on Strava and on all the social medias. And, I mean, I'll be tracking you with the Berlin race, man. That, good luck. Thanks, Lucas. It's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you so much. See ya.